he was part of the story. He was in the behind the scenes team building the storylines. Yeah. So that's, I mean, God, talk about interesting depth of whatever. You know, it's like he's Hawaiian, mm -hmm. not Japanese. That's crazy. Playing a Japanese villain. Yeah. Um, playing to stereotypes. Um, part of the storytelling, but he studied sumo. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Milena Ortega and I am the LA County Arts Intern for La Plaza de Cultura y Artes in Los Angeles. I have been given the honor to host this podcast for La Plaza, which will be called La Plaza's Olympic Auditorium Podcast. And this podcast is centered around La Plaza de Cultura y Artes, their current 18th and Grand Olympic Auditorium exhibition. That is, uh, it, it will be in La Plaza until, I believe, May of 2024. So if you haven't gone to see it, yet, see it yet, I highly recommend. It has lots of history about the Olympic Auditorium, which was an epicenter of boxing, wrestling, music, roller derby. It is a critical part of L.A. culture and... Uh, I'm here to talk about it with a lot of wonderful and knowledgeable guests today. Um, but quick thing about me, I recently graduated from UCLA with a degree in World Arts and Cultures and a minor in Film and Television Studies. Um, I'm originally from the Bay Area, so I, I'm hoping I can give a good insight on this podcast as to why people like me from the outside should be interested in history and especially in like uh, places that hold so much culture and unity for a bunch of communities in Los Angeles, especially for Latino communities. I myself, I am uh, Chilean and Venezuelan, so I am of South American background, um, which is another aspect I think will be in interesting to bring into this podcast because uh, I think California is very Mexican-American dominated. And for me, it's really special to get to learn about other cultures and about how um, about how it is important to uplift uh, maybe cultures that aren't my own. Because for me, as, as a, a South American person of descent, I don't get a lot of representation, not any really and so I'd like to set an example and uplift other uh, Latin American stories so that we can continue to share and educate people on the rich culture of Latin America. But today I am joined by producer, director, curator, and Emmy-nominated filmmaker Steve Debro, who is the inspiration of La Plaza's Olympic Auditorium Exhibition. Steve is the director of the 18th and Grand Olympic Auditorium Story. Um, so I would recommend watching that first before you tune into this podcast. But the Olympic, the 18th and Grand Olympic Auditorium Story is the Emmy-nominated Emmy uh, story of the Los Angeles Historic Olympic Auditorium. Uh, the film was the closing film for Slam Dance Film Festival, an official selection for the San Diego Latino and the Bushwick Film Festivals, as well as featured in Variety, Hyperallergic, and Film Threat. So welcome, Steve. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Milena. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited to have you here today. And as I've told you in our pre previous conversation, I am learning about this place as we go. So I'm very, very excited to hear your like journey as to becoming so knowledgeable on the Olympic Auditorium. Um, so I guess I want to start, I, I know you've probably been asked this question a thousand times, but I would love to hear how your, your journey into creating this documentary, like how it got you, how did you come about making it? Well, um, thank you for having me and thanks for doing this uh, podcast. Um, <sighs> 
the journey came in a few different ways. Um, one, I grew up in L.A., and uh, the Olympic was always on TV. Um, as a uh, kind of latchkey kid in the 1970s, um, and even remembering it from childhood, very sort of fuzzy childhood memories of of the 60s, I remember the wild action at the Olympic Auditorium on TV. Um, so there was roller derby, which was just, it was insane. And the skating was great, and they were always hitting each other, and somehow the T-Birds, the local team, would come back and win at the last second every time. And I was like, hmm, is this re I don't know. And then wrestling was crazy too, you know? Um, and boxing was something I watched with my dad, and I really enjoyed that. Um, you know, I saw guys like, I mean, not in person, but on TV, guys like Danny Little Red Lopez and Bobby Chacon, um, fighters that just um, were iconic. Um, and so it, it, it sort of was, you know, sort of in the back of my mind. Um, and then through adulthood, I got into the music business. I was in bands and then I was in the music business for years. And when the music business um, started to change and I didn't feel like it was really for me anymore, um, I was trying to figure out uh, creative things to do to use my... Um, background and knowledge to do something else. Mm -hmm. And um, a friend of mine named David Davis, who was a sports writer, had shown me these pictures of Theo Errett. Um, and Theo Errett was the house photographer at the, at the Olympic Auditorium from the mid-60s through the early 80s. And David was working on a book about Theo Errett, a photo book that was... Um, uh, that was to include Theo's, Theo's images and some of the backstory behind that. And I felt immediately that there was sort of something more. It, it triggered something in me. And these images, many of which are in the exhibition and in the film, um, almost made the action at the Olympic larger than life. And then once I discovered and started digging a little bit deeper into the Olympic story itself, it felt like this sort of really, really interesting well of history. Um, one, that it was run by a woman for 40 years, yeah. practically, Eileen Eaton, and that just seemed remarkable to me that she was sort of this forgotten person and then as I got into the stories and the characters, it just it just stuck to me. Yeah. And I it made me want to dig deeper. And as it went on, I got to know Theo Arid. Um and you know, the story is complicated, but ultimately um I felt like this was a story that needed to be told. Um, it elevated the story. It was an L.A. story that hadn't really been told. And it and through the Olympic story, you, it touches upon so many different elements of Los Angeles and elevates stories that weren't really that that weren't overdone, um, especially the the story of Mexican-American and Mexican-American here, Mexican and Mexican and Mexican-American heroes who connected so strongly with the people and the way that when I talk to people about the Olympic Auditorium, their eyes lit up and it just felt like it, there was something unusual and something magical. And it, then it sort of gave me uh, a funnel in which to tell this bigger story about Los Angeles and in turn just a larger story that I think anyone could be interested in. Yeah. No, that's what I, from your documentary, like everyone that you interviewed, I could see how they would light up talking about this place, you know, despite it having a lot of violent events too. Like it was such a rush, I think, an adrenaline rush. And I think you've done such a wonderful job of creating a story from this piece of history because 
I think before this documentary, um, first of all, I didn't know anything about the Olympic Auditorium until about a month ago when I started my internship. Um, and I think that's like, like for me, I didn't think I would relate to any of it because I grew up, a, I was a dancer. <laughs> I'm, I'm a girl, you know, these sports, you know, I, you know, it doesn't matter what gender you are, but for me, like I never was drawn to these types of sports and I I found myself connecting to this sense of lib, like liberation and expression that was seems to be the energy of the Olympic, you know. Yeah, I mean that I I hear you and and you know, my background was in music. Um I was in and around the early LA punk rock scene. By the time it got to the Olympic, to me, it was, the scene was kind of splintering and the more violent side went to the Olympics, so which didn't really interest me because yeah. I'm not a violent person by <laughs> nature. Yet there was something so visceral and so interesting and the subject of violence is very interesting too in this world that we live in that's so constantly violent and and you know the the own thoughts in my own mind about you know is this promoting violence is is organized violence within this sort of thing is that a positive or a negative does that become a a place for people to let out their emotions without having to hit someone else on the yeah. street I don't know the answer to these questions, yeah. but to me, it's very provocative on so many different levels. And the other thing that you you noted was like, I wanted to make a film and, and share a story that anyone could connect to that my hope was that this was not just for the fans, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I wanted to make sure, number one, that yes, the fans were, felt like it authentically represented their experience so that with the, the boxing anyone who's boxing that's why I, I dug so deep in because I didn't want to be a poser because this wasn't my world it's not my story mm. it's it's someone else's story so I wanted to come in open-minded and respectful and just try to understand the appeal and understand it from the fighters perspective from the fans perspective from the wrestlers the skaters and the musicians and in a way, I think it was kind of good that I didn't, I wasn't a super fanboy. Because yeah. um, if I was a super fanboy, then I'd, I think I would, wouldn't have been able to have a certain, you know, you want to have a little bit of detachment from your, as a, as a creative person and as someone who wanted to study the history so that I could see it without being so attached to good or bad or making value judgments or this person's story is valid and this person isn't or whatever. Because what I found in dealing with um, the super fans and the historians of all the niche um, sports and subcultures is that, you know, they're fan, in a way they're fans first. Mm -hmm. And that's great. But also, I think in some ways, it just, in some ways, as a, for someone trying to create a more universal story and look at it from the, a little bit of detachment, um, it, it, I think, clouds people's judgment a hair, maybe, or it just makes it very personal. So um, while I have built a lot of really close relationships in this process, I'm me and I took my own take on things and, you know, and I think, you know, most fans really, you know, the, the super fans really like it. Some feel like, mm -hmm. oh, I didn't include this person or yeah. I didn't give enough time to one thing or the other. But as a filmmaker, as a creator, that was my prerogative. And so it was my, it, it's, it's my way of rendering the Olympics story um, which someone else could approach in in a very different way. But it's the way I saw it and the way that I tried to get to is some essential truths. And um, 
to sort of, I, I see the Olympic as a place where outsiders had a chance mm -hmm. to kind of prove it on a big stage. And even though that might have come at great sacrifice to their health, um, it was it was it was a place where, you know, where people from uh, the poorest of neighborhoods could become world champions, yeah. and that and that was really interesting to me. And someone and a divorced thirty year old woman could end up building a an empire that you know stretched. I mean, certainly within California and into Mexico, but had an impact around the world. So I found that endlessly compelling, and that's what I tried to get across in, in the film. Yeah, I think you did a remarkable job of that, and I, I really appreciate your approach of not being a super fan, because I also think it would have been obvious if you were a super fan in the film, you probably would have spent more time on like a certain aspect of the Olympic, and <clears throat> I think like, at first, I think I had a hard time grappling as to how I could like do like, because this is like, I feel like I'm also trying to do this podcast in a, in a sense that can reach all sorts of people. And I never realized how special it is to like learn about it while like you're doing it. And and I think it is really important too. I'm I'm so glad to hear that you did as much like research as you could. I was listening to your your podcast that you did with um, the one you had sent me. I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you were talking about how you were reading so much about every aspect, the blueprints, like any sort of historical like archive you could find of the Olympic, because you have to look at all of it, not just like the sports and the events, you know, and it's really inspiring. I think also as a creative person, you have to feel qualified to talk about these things. And I was super scared to like do this because I'm like, I'm not qualified to talk about this. But but as I'm learning and I've the first day at La Plaza, I was also like absorbing everything. I took like two rounds, the museum, I watched your documentary and it's I think it does an amazing job to appeal to everyone like like my own family like I watched the documentary with my parents I went home a few weeks ago and I brought it to them and they loved it and my mom was saying that my grandpa would love it because my grandpa loves boxing and I think these like sports are all like very universal to I think also just by the years like because it, uh, the golden years were like in the 40s and the 50s I think older generations do feel very connected to it. And yeah, I don't know if you... Yeah, I mean, I, I traditionally, things like sports mm -hmm. have not been thought of as serious um, yeah. and worthy of study. I mean, certainly um, boxing, wrestling, roller derby were seen as like lower class. And I... and. Um, and it's been heartening for me, um, to have serious historians and a serious institution like La Plaza, um, validate the work that I've done. Yeah. Um, because, you know, uh, William Estrada, who's the history chair at the Natural History Museum, who's one of the foremost California historians, he and is in the film, he he got it early on. He was like, this is an area of study that no one is really doing. Mm -hmm. And it's really important because it's the study of people's, what regular people did in their spare time. It's like, these are, you know, the working people could go to the Olympic Auditorium. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting mix, you know, for a fight night, for a boxing night, you could have movie stars, you could have mob guys, yeah. you could have business people, and you can have bricklayers all there. Um, not to say it was some utopian mix where everyone was no. was 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 um, uh, connecting together, but within the same within the same uh, under the same roof, they were uh, they were there unified and 
you know, even, I mean, that was hard to find archival material because all the lots of the tapes were just destroyed because people didn't think, they thought this was just ephemeral. It was of the moment. It was not going to last. Who cared? Who needed it? So I get all these, I get a lot of inquiries from people through social media like, hey, my dad fought there. Do you have, you know, film of him? He fought in the 1950s. And I'm just, I have to tell them it's, there's so little that has been saved. It would just be an incredible fluke. It's a fluke or it has to be like a championship fight for something to have been saved. And the same with wrestling and roller derby, which are seen as even lower than boxing and wrestling because at least, you know, boxing had a sort of a celebrity, um, you know, it was more, it was seen as a more serious yeah. sport than the frivolous nature, quote unquote, of wrestling roller derby. Yeah. Uh, I find it interesting you say how a lot of these archival like footage or, or hit like I guess records of other fighters are lost. I want to know how how long did it take you to I guess gather all of these <laughs> all of these like people that used to fight there. All of these uh, sp uh, what's the word athletes and yeah the footage that you had even of in the documentary was. It was, Impressive. I mean, oh, it was, it was a real, it was a fascinating process because I was a first time filmmaker too. So I, I bit off more than, and it, oh my God. I mean, cause it's, it's, it's editing a film like this is, was really, really hard yeah. because you had a, a tight, I didn't, at one point it was like, could we, this really should just be a series because there's so much, but I didn't have that experience or the funds to do this as a series. Um, and I was learning as I was going. Um, I did 50 long form interviews, um, 4K, shot them 4K. Um, I was fortunate to have Tony Peck, who is my DP, willing to do this work. A lot of people bought into this vision that I had and 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 stepped up. But in terms of finding archival, it was hit and miss and learning. And then, you know, UCLA Film and Television Archive was an incredible resource. They're very expensive, but yeah. they have things that no <laughs> one that no one else has. And um so, you know, in piecing it together, Finding the Eileen Eaton interviews at the museum, like at, at UCLA, was a huge when that happened. Because, you know, obviously she's the central point, but if you don't have her voice, yeah. what do you have? You have a lot of people talking about her, but to find these, there's basically three interviews that we were able to find of her. Um, one was from 1974 for the Bobby Chacon, Danny Little Red Lopez fight. One was after the big riot in 1964. And, um, there was another one, sort of a comeback of boxing story in, around 1970. Those gave us the bridge to get her voice and feel like we know her in there. I don't, it would have been a different film without that. And we were, we were, so I guess it's. I would say the film evolved as we found archival, um, a lot of stuff and, and thus, and in that process of digging was how the exhibition basically took shape in many ways yeah. because people would say, oh, this collector has robes, this one has lucha masks, this one has, oh, look at these you know, the, the photography in the show is insane. So not just Theo Eret, but Theo Eret, and thanks to him and his family who've been so wonderful along the way in terms of being supportive. Um, but also, you know, guys like uh, Dan Navarro, whose father, Hap Navarro, was the first Latino matchmaker at the Hollywood Legion uh, Stadium. He got pushed out mysteriously, had to leave Los Angeles Basically, overnight, um, we, I can't confirm, but I'm pretty darn certain it was the mob that pushed him out. And he was haunted by that, but he collected photographic 
um, negatives um, with an intention of doing a book. Yeah. And he died before being able to do that book. But his son, who I knew incidentally through the music business, because his son is a musician, and I didn't even know his father was this matchmaker, and I found some video, and then I saw it was Dan Navarro, and then I connected with him. He had these glass negatives um, and celluloid negatives from the 1920s through the 1950s and 60s that he let me use and let us reprint for the exhibition. And these were like, so these materials came from odd and weird places. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the Olympic is that there's like, it's almost a like one degree of separation mm -hmm. around the city and things just came to me um, as I was doing this because people wanted to help and wanted this story remembered. Yeah. So that was another part of the the process. Wow. I From like hearing about how the exhibit the exhibition came to be like how you said how people were offering to bring like their relatives robes from when they fought or the lucha masks even the the floating head posters like it it is like it seemed like a very much a community effort which i think i'm sure inspired you even more to like put it, this together it did because it also felt like this was a disappearing culture yeah it was like literally you know, when I started interviewing people, I recognized, or before I started, I was like, if I don't interview them now, they will soon be gone, yeah. and this story will not be able to be told. It will be forgotten and lost to history. It's like recent recent history, which is like disappearing before our eyes. So I, interview, I think I said I interviewed 50 people. 12 of those people are now dead. Wow. And so I feel also very proud of the fact that um, that I was able to, and it wasn't just, it's not just me. I have a team of people, so yeah, I want to give them all the credit. No, yeah. But I just want to say like the, the, that we were able to capture these stories before, they beca before it became impossible to tell the story, at least in a firsthand way. Yeah. Um, for the people who were there, and went to fights in the 40s, you know. Um, we had Don Frazier is in the documentary. He went to the Golden Gloves in the 1930s. So, you know, and the building opened in 25. So you've got this breadth of time, these people who experienced the Olympic Auditorium from nearly the very beginning to the end. And that, to me, was really... Um, meaningful to kind of save this culture. It's almost just a, you know, um, I know you're, you're, I'm a Bruin too. I went to UCLA. Yeah. Um, I have my, <laughs> my degree in political science and took a ton of film classes too. Yeah. So I have a lot of appreciation for that. And, but you're, you're just being a world arts and culture major, like understanding the value of cultures you may not fully understand yourself, yeah. but that they are valuable. And I saw this as a valuable culture that was worth preserving, mm -hmm. and I wanted to snap to it. And I was very, very grateful for all the people that have helped along the way, that all the people that are still, you know, I mean, this film could have died. We were supposed to open in March of 2020 when COVID hit. We were opening at the Cinerama Dome. Um, and, you know, I'm a persistent person and I didn't want it to die. And I wanted this story to live on. And I'm very gratified that it, you know, that to have the exhibition, which is so meaningful to me and seemingly it seems to be meaningful to the people who are seeing it, um, has allowed it to have another continuing life. And I hope it continues to live on, um, you know, by, even beyond when it, the exhibition closes in May. But we'll yeah. see. No, I mean, I think you've created a legacy and... Even like at the end of your documentary, you still honor the people that you did interview that unfortunately did pass away. But it seemed like the timing of it worked out perfectly. You know, it, you got to talk to these people and and I'm sure like they are so happy that you are continuing their legacy and telling their story. And and I think you've you've done a remarkable job of it all. Well, thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I was very, you know, it was, it was, I had a few, like, really kind of like 
choke you up experiences where um, two of the people, uh, Bob Resendez, who was a historian that Gene Aguilera uh, connected me with, who um, was the he was the nephew of Louis Magana, who was the um, Louis was the publicist uh, for boxing and wrestling and the wrestling announcer. Um, and he was a, a character and a dandy and everyone loved him. Uh, he was there longer even than Eileen. Um, he, we interviewed him and he was dying of cancer and got to bring a rough cut and show it to him, um, a week before he died. And then Don Chargan, who I was even closer to, who was, you know, loved Eileen and, and just wanted to see this story done. Um, I showed the film to him when he was literally like two days before he died. Um, he asked me to come up. I drove up to Cambria where he lived and I showed it to him on a laptop and he just smiled. Oh my and then God. He, so it was, I mean, I, this project changed my life. I mean, I, and I, and I, um, whatever the the grind and the the pain and the difficult parts of it and the frustrations and the exhaustion of the whole thing in many ways it um it's something that will always be a a part of me and the experiences that i had it shows how you know history studying history and 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 those, I think history matters. I think people need to I understand agree. why history matters because it helps us understand where we are now. Exactly. It <laughs> gives us a clue that where what we're experiencing has been experienced before many, 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 yeah. many, many times over by other people. It may not be exactly the same, but it's very yeah. similar. And so to me, this is, you know, why does the Olympic matter now? Okay, that's a, you know, to me, the Olympic matters now because you know, the issues of violence and what is that, what does that mean? The issues of, um, the issues of, um, how do we make sense of, um, of the past? Do these, why is it important to tell stories of people who are underrepresented in the historical record? Um, all of those things I think really matter. And so um, I didn't want to make it just a nostalgia trip. I wanted to make it so that anyone could see the film or see the exhibition and have a connection to this and want to know more and ask their own questions. Yeah. Talk to their families. Why did it matter to you, Dad? Yeah. It, it, it should provoke it should provoke conversations, intergenerational conversations. Yeah. And those are all things I think that, that are important. I completely agree, and I think with that, I want to ask, like, why should it matter to people who aren't from L.A., like me? Like, why should it? I mean, yeah, I'm from San Francisco, both cities in California, but very different cities, and that compared to the rest of the United States and the rest of the world, why should it matter? Well, I mean, I always felt like it, it feels very universal to me. Number one, these were all, this was popular entertainment that existed around the country and in some places, some ways around the world. Um, uh, so while the Olympic was unique in that it connected with Hollywood and it was really big, San Francisco had its own world, yeah. boxing, wrestling, roller derby. Roller derby was based out of San Francisco yeah. for years. See, I didn't know that. <laughs> um, and and um, it just, you know, it, it reflects, I mean, if you look into you know what what was popular entertainment at during these this period of time mm -hmm. in our country and what does that say what do the stereotypes of wrestling characters for example like why was you know Mr. Moto a Japanese villain so popular or so hated yeah. because he came after World War II exactly. when you know we had been fed a diet of of hating Japanese and his, so he played into stereotypes. Um, uh, why is boxing so important to uh, Latino culture in so many yeah. ways? Um, all of those things, 
you know, there's obviously much more than that, but all of those things I think are relevant to what we're experiencing now and are worth is worth talking about. And it's it's worldwide. Boxing is still popular around the world. Wrestling is bigger than it's ever been. Roller derby has morphed into something different. It's now a participatory women's uh, primarily, I'm 99% yeah. women's game. So they're all, you know, they're all threads of history that all tie back. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's why it's more than just Los Angeles. Yeah, I completely agree. And, and at first, I also thought it would be something that I would have a harder time, like understanding, like, why should I care about this? But then I think anyone can find a way to resonate with, uh, la with with this uh, uh documentary okay i wanted to ask you about how you were able to get into contact with la plaza about okay. like the exhibition sure um the funny part was that i i read i was thinking about an exhibition like from the beginning or really early on and uh, even though I didn't have all the pieces together, I was ideating on this project in so many ways because it just drew me down and drew me down and drew me down this rabbit hole. And I read about the opening of the museum, and I thought, wow, this would, that would be the perfect place for this exhibition. And I had it pegged in my mind. And years and years and years pass, and um, in the process of of doing the uh, project I connected with Jean Aguilera. Jean, um, I mentioned to Jean that I, you know, that I wanted to do this as an exhibition. And I can't remember if he said, well, I know, I know the guy that runs La Plaza, John Echeveste. I can't remember exactly whether how that happened, but I said, well, I really want to meet him. Um, so Gene connected us, um, and I talked to John about it. This was while the documentary was still unfinished. And um, he said, well, okay, well, why don't I, I propose doing a program at La Plaza. So I did a program where I showed some excerpts and I brought a boxer, a wrestler, and I, I think that was it. I think we were trying to get a skater too, but she didn't show up. Anyway, um, we did a program, and it was well attended, and it was it was cool. And John was there, and he thought it was it was good. Then I stayed in contact with John over time, and sent him uh, the finished film. And he really liked it a lot. And, you know, I, it was just a continual process of, and then, you know, Gene and I went out with him again. And finally, I was just like, John, you know, this really should be an exhibition. And I have the, you know, I have the materials. And I think him seeing the finished film mattered. And um, so... I think he was impressed with the film. I think he felt like, yes, this makes sense. I think the fact that he knew Gene too. And interestingly, John's father was a sports writer uh, at one point in his life and had written about Enrique Bolaños, oh. who was one of the stars of the Olympic yeah. Auditorium. So... John felt like it was an important story, and so he said, yeah, I want to put this on the schedule. So he did, and then he uh, he retired. So um, we connected with Karen Cruz Hendon, the curator, mm -hmm. um, and presented it to her. Um, it went very well. We really got along. Then... Uh, Leticia uh, joined uh, Leticia Reed Buckley, who uh, is the CEO of La Plaza currently. 
she came in and uh, had to kind of repitch this the, yeah. the project to her, and she loved it too, and really felt like this is a uh, important story worth telling, and so that's how it happened. And you know, the process was really intense, uh, just putting the exhibition together. Um, we had it wasn't a typical. Uh, a typical exhibition where you're dealing with institutions and borrowing from institutions or from artists themselves or, or collectors. Yeah. This is a lot of families. And it's a huge range of people who've never, you know, some of them really don't have a strong relationship with the museum experience. And some who had an experience with museums were with bogus museums. There were like boxing and wrestling museums that borrowed people's things and then went out of business and then they never got their stuff back. So we had a lot of obstacles and it took a lot of handholding and it's an enormous show because it's two floors. So it was an incredibly challenging process, but ultimately I think very uh, you know, it was very ambitious for, I mean, if anyone, for those who haven't seen it, um, it's very, uh, visceral and very dynamically presented. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, we have a ring, we've got, uh, full uniforms, we have, you know, incredible masks and really beautifully built out. It's, a, it's a beautiful exhibition. So, um, which building within a very narrow time band was very challenging. Um, it ended up being like the finishing of the film and like many production jobs, honestly, they go down to the wire and are very stressful. Um, and hopefully the ends, uh, justify the means because it's not easy. And, um, but, I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the fact that it's getting, it's exposing the Olympic to a different audience, to a wider audience. It allows people to take their time and go through and see the objects and see what they care about. Cause you know, for, for super fans, you know, some of them love wrestling and don't really care about boxing and vice versa. Yeah. And so this, if you want, if you love boxing, there's tons of boxing. If you love wrestling, there's tons of wrestling. You don't have to, you don't have to, care about the other stuff. So, um, and if you just want to know about LA history and see cool stuff, that's also a good reason to go. Yeah. No, I, I'll probably talk about this with Karen and Esperanza because I will be having them also join me in a conversation. But what I do like admire of the exhibition is the fact that it's like, everything that's in, or most of everything in the exhibition is from like families and I could tell you I've been to so many museums in LA and I'm sure the majority I worked at the Hammer Museum you know and all of these like um everything that they have in these museums are from other institutions and it seems like a snob fest sometimes and I think the authenticity of having these pieces come from families and from real people that have relatives or they themselves experienced like being in this environment at the Olympic it just makes it all the more authentic and especially as a filmmaker in today there is a call for authenticity in films that talk about minority groups and La Plaza does a lot of all their work is for Latinos and Mexican Americans. So I want to know how it felt to, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, to be on the outside of that. You know, I know that must be really jarring to well, do. I mean, I'm, I'm an Angelino. So, you know, obviously the, the culture, that culture is so important and part of Los Angeles. Um, but yes, I'm, not Latino. So um, I feel honored in a lot of ways that that um, that the museum, a museum dedicated Latino to Latino and Mexican and Mexican American culture 
would see the work as important. Um, I also just felt like it was honest in the sense that the majority of the fighters and the fans were Mexican, Mexican American. Yeah. So, I, I like, you know, and that's not. But I, what was interesting from the beginning was I said to Karen, I asked Karen straight up, uh, and Esperanza straight up, I was like, "Do you want this just to be about Latino fighters?" Um, and they said no, mm -hmm. um, because they're the the experience at the Olympic was not just Latino, yeah. um, but it was the majority. So I feel like it has a good mix. Um, and just because something is predominantly Latino, but it mixes with the main culture, that's the way LA is. Yeah. And so to me, that is, um, that's the nice part of it. And, um, and I just, I entered it with the same, head that I entered the whole project with, which is, um, I, like I said before, this isn't my story, but I see the validity of this story. And I, I believe, um, I believe that the story needs, needs to be seen and heard. And so I'm not the museum. It was their choice to decide to, 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 um, elevate this these cultures and elevate the Olympic story. And I'm just very proud to have been able to kind of help facilitate that. Yeah. So I see myself um, just, it's, yes, it's very, it's a very tricky time to be someone who is um, not of a group um, telling the story of a group that isn't yours. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of questions about that and they're all valid questions. And um, I don't represent that I um, am anything but who I am, mm -hmm. who is a, someone who's very interested in the Olympic story as a whole. And it, I'd have to be blind to not, or willfully blind to not recognize that a, a huge part of that was the Latino story. Yeah. And so in that, you know, there's a huge African-American story within the Olympic Auditorium. And I believe the African-American Museum could do a story about the African-American part of the Olympic story. I think that um, all a lot of different museums could have done this, but to me, this was extremely appropriate. Oh, yeah. And... Um, and uh, again, I am, uh, I feel like someone who just sort of is helping to facilitate this larger story. And if there's a focus on some aspect of it that is, uh, resonates with a particular community, then that's great. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm happy to work with people in the community to help tell that story. Um, so again, Karen Cruz Hendon is the curator. Esperanza Sanchez is the curator from the museum. Jean Aguilera was a boxing expert. And I, uh, so for me, um, I'm, well, the vision for 18th and Grand was mine. The way that it's told in different ways isn't all mine. Yeah. And the stories aren't mine. Yeah. The stories are the people's. And so that's, that's how I see it. Yeah, I think I think this industry could learn a lot from that, from your uh, journey of putting together the documentary because I think you've put it together very eloquently and it, it's, it's really inspiring to see how open-minded you are because I think because like most of the sports it at that went on at the Olympic were dominated by minority groups, I think because it was almost forgotten until you did this documentary, I think that says a lot, you know, how it could have been forgotten if you hadn't done this. And I think especially as an outsider, I think we can learn a lot 
by uplifting each other, especially minority groups, because there is still so much representation that needs to be shown in media, in in any sort of, I guess, expressive outlet. And I, I, I think this is like a wonderful way to do it because you encapsulate not just Latinos, like you said, you encapsulate um, African Americans that were part of these sports Mr. Moto, like that, that part, like it was so fascinating to me how, you know, he had to kind of play into the stereotype to get like the recognition and it's problematic, but you know what? He had to make a career out of it because that's the time they were living in, you know? And to complicate it more, he was part of the story. He was in the behind the scenes team building the storylines. Yeah. So... That's, I mean, God, talk about interesting depth of whatever. You know, it's like he's Hawaiian, mm -hmm. not Japanese, That's crazy. playing a Japanese villain, yeah. um, playing to stereotypes, um, part of the storytelling, but he studied sumo, had his own kimonos, was very much of Japanese descent. But then what's interesting is that like guys like the Destroyer, white guy, went to Japan to lose and be made fun of to the Japanese crowd after the war. So there's, I mean, wrestling is so interesting in that yeah. way, which I didn't, I didn't really fully appreciate when I started this. I, I've gained an appreciation for the, the, the cultures themselves um, and become very close with a lot of people, the families of, fighters themselves, um, because I recognize the craft, I recognize the, um, the storytelling. I rep, I rep, I recognize the problematic stuff too. I mean, and I tried to not get caught up so much in judging what was yeah. like, I felt like, you know, I'm presenting and let, uh, you know, there's lots of conversations about racial stereotyping, for example, in wrestling and how those represent um, the times that the villains of today and the villains of the past represented the things that were going on, um, that are going on in, in society. So things that are really like not cool, really, they're not cool, yet, they're part of it. And so how do you, how does one represent them? You can't try to view it all through today's lens because they're not, those things were happening at their time. Yeah, they're a product and of their time. They're a product of their time. And I think that's a fascinating way and how we as creative people and how humanity wants to put everything through the prism of today is really, yes, of course, we look at those things and go, God, that's so wrong. It's really wrong. You know, the Japanese were interned and blah, blah, blah. How is this, how is this okay? And I'm not saying it's, it is, but I'm saying it was a thing. And so we have to be able to talk about those things. Yeah. We have to be able to look at them and say what was acceptable. You can't, if you cancel someone from the 40s or 50s, it's sort of pointless. Yeah. Because that was, they were, they were operating within the, 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 the context of their time, you can look down on it and say it's, it was wrong or society was wrong. Yeah. But, you know, we have to be sensitive to where we are, what we're going through. And these times are so fraught. So as storytellers, I really, I really wanted to be super sensitive yeah. about how I did this and say, and use the voices of historians. If you notice the voices in, of the historians in the film are primarily Latinos talking about boxing, wrestling, and L.A. at the time. Because, um, again, not my story. Mm -hmm. But putting those voices to help give context to the story and, and certainly um, constructing the narrative that I felt like was an accurate narrative... Um, but it's always subjective to some degree, as you know. Yeah. I mean, it's it's literally like you make a film and you can say, I'm not, I don't have no voiceover, 
but in the choices you make, of course, as an editor, oh yeah, and who you talk to and who you don't yeah. talk to, are all choices. And so you have to do your best as a human being within all of the strictures. But I think also on the positive side that these stories are now, hopefully more stories are getting told that better reflect how we live and how we lived. And the Olympic story to me was a way to better reflect the LA that I know and I experienced. Yeah. Which is very interesting, very multicultural, very much um, with contributions from all different kinds of people that that's the strength of a city. That's the strength of a world to me. Other people don't see it that way, but that to me is what makes the world interesting is all of those. When you say you're, you're uh, uh, Venezuelan and Chilean and you're coming at it from a different perspective, that's great because you have a way of telling stories through your perspective and with an open mind and a, a respect for your subject matter and deep engagement with whatever you choose to do, you can bring something new to the story. Wow. So, Thank you so much. That was so beautifully said. And Steve, you did a remarkable job of like doing it from a non-biased point of view, all the, the documentary and I'm sure you oversee the exhibition as well, oversaw, I don't know what the word is, but we are coming to the end of our episode. It was an honor to talk to you today. Um, Thank you, Melina. I'm very inspired by you as like a creative myself, and I'm hoping I can apply your experience into whatever future project I'd like to pursue. So thank you so much for this conversation. You're very welcome. I'll just do one quick plug. So to see the movie, if you yes. want to see it. Okay. <laughs> the movie is on Amazon Prime uh, or Prime Video, as they like to be called. Um, and um, it's also available on Blu-ray, uh, which you can get uh, either at La Plaza or through our website. Our website's www.18thandgrand.com. And there's lots of information about um, the people behind the scenes, uh, the crew, uh, all the talented people who are part of this, and whatever else we've got going on. There's T-shirts also at La Plaza. And um, anyway, uh, thank you, Melina. Thank you so much. And we'll be doing another episode with the curators coming up next. Stay tuned for it. Uh, yeah, see you next time.